Madam President? The Senator from Utah. I, I thank my colleague. He's always gracious and a very fine man, and I enjoy serving with him very much. Uh, I was really disappointed that the, the cybersecurity bill the, and it had to be brought, uh, that, it, that we couldn't <coughs> proceed with it today. Uh, this side had to vote against cloture. And the reason was is because the Senate is not being run as an open Senate anymore. Uh, this is such an important bill. It's not just some itty-bitty bill that you can call up and foreclose any amendments. In fact, most bills uh, are not that, that are brought to the floor. And I think if it were the other way around and, and the, Republicans in the, the Republicans were in the majority and they started doing what we've been going through lately, and I don't blame President and Senator Reid for this. I, I know that it comes from his caucus. Uh, but if we were pulling the same type of thing, I've got to tell you the Democrats would be in orbit. Because usually in the Senate, you never build the uh, procedural pyramid until after there's been a reasonable time for debate and open amendments. And that's the way it's usually done. In recent uh, months, frankly, the last few years, they call up a bill, file cloture as though we're filibustering when we're not, and then uh, tie up the parliamentary tree so you can't have amendments in the greatest deliberative body in the world, supposedly. And that's been very irritating to a lot of people on our side. And I would just caution my friends on the other side. This is getting to the point where it's becoming a matter of great concern to everybody and irritation to everybody as well. And I think we ought to get back to being the Senate that we all know works better if we respect both sides and their ability to be able to come up and say what they need to and bring the amendments up that they feel are, are, are good amendments. But be that as it may, uh, that's the way it is right now. And we have to do this cybersecurity bill. Everybody knows that. And the fact that closure was not invoked does not mean that, uh, that we shouldn't return to that bill and put the time into it and make sure that we resolve the conflicts that, are, that have arisen, some of which are very, very important suggestions, and uh, allow the type of... Uh, proceeding that really the Senate has always been known for until recent years. Now, I'd like to change the subject. Uh, Madam President, recently there's been some commentary about the lack of substance in our political debates. Now, this concern that Washington has failed to confront our deepest political challenges, which are in large part fiscal challenges, is not without some merit. But I would add one caveat to this analysis. It is not for lack of trying on the part of Republicans to have a grown-up debate about our nation's fiscal and economic future. Republicans are putting forward real ideas about tax reform and entitlement reform with real numbers attached. But I would submit that only one side has put a team on the field for this debate. When it comes to putting forward solutions to our nearly $16 trillion in debt and our, and our archaic tax code, the President and his Democratic allies have largely stayed on the sideline. Instead of offering up bold proposals to bring down the debt that, that has ballooned, given the President's commitment to ever larger and more activist government, they have determined to give the American people talking points that attack the wealthy and successful small businesses in the name of equality. Now, given the fiscal cliff threatening America's families and businesses, this decision to put politics above solutions is madness. But there is a method to it. The fact is, the President and his liberal allies are not able to put forward serious solutions because they are between a rock and a hard place. The rock is their base, a liberal minority that refuses any meaningful reforms of the spending programs that are bankrupting our country. The hard place is the vast majority of the American people who flatly object to the massive tax increases, and especially those 940,000 small businesses that would be hit the hardest. And, uh, of course, uh, those massive tax increases would be required to finance on a permanent basis the President's commitment to larger government. The bottom line is that the President is unable to come clean. He cannot tell the American people what the true tax bill would be 
for his expansion of government. He suggests that our books can be balanced just by taxing the rich. We all know that's poppycock. Hence his commitment to the Buffett tax and other redistributionist schemes that have been pursued by the Senate's Democratic leadership over the past two years, as though they're really serious. Give me a break. But no serious person believes that the Obama administration's government can be financed simply by going after the so-called wealthy. The only way to do it is by going after all Americans and raising taxes on all citizens. That is the silent plan that the president will not discuss on the campaign trail. That is the Democrats' phantom budget. And that is what I want to discuss today. When it comes to addressing our deficits and debt, only one party in Washington has been willing to put its cards on the table. Only one party has been willing to acknowledge the difficult choices, the, the difficult choices that have to be made. The other side has refused to provide any concrete solutions of their own while demonizing anyone who, had the, who has had the temerity to propose anything resembling a workable solution. The case in point, it has been more than three years, three years, since the Senate, which has been under Democratic control the entire time, passed a budget resolution. Those budget resolutions are mandatory, and yet they just blithely ignore it. Three years, three years without a budget. Four years ago, if someone wrote a novel or a screenplay about a Senate majority that refused to pass a budget for three years, people in both parties would have laughed and called it absurd. Yet here we are, three years later. In fact, the only budget proposals from the Democrats have come from the White House, and they have been anything but serious. According to the CBO, the President's most recent budget would keep the U.S. on the same unsustainable path with an ever-widening gap between revenues and spending varying from 8.7% to 2.5% of GDP and averaging 3.2% of GDP. Now, keep this in mind when you hear the President and his allies suggest that we can get our debt under control simply by raising taxes on the wealthy. The President raises plenty of taxes on upper-income individuals and small businesses in his budget, yet under the President's budget, debt, uh, uh, debt held by the public would still reach 76.3% of GDP by the end of the budget window. Now, even the President's budget, which raises taxes significantly, comes in with a debt level that is well above what leading economists such as Kenneth Rogoff and Carmen Reithart consider the danger zone of 70 percent. The President claimed just a few weeks ago that his biggest failing over the last three years was that he just cared too darn much about policy. If only that was true. But the fact is, he ignores the policy experts and their warnings when it comes to the debt. Consider what CBO Director Elmendorf wrote to House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan regarding the debt earlier this year. And I have to say, Mr. Elmendorf is a Democrat, but I have found him to be extremely trustworthy and honest. And here's what he wrote. Budgetary policies affect the economy in a variety of ways. All else being equal, scenarios with higher debt tend to, tend to imply lower output and income in the long run than do scenarios with lower debt because increased government borrowing generally crowds out private investment in productive capital, leading to a smaller stock of capital than would otherwise be the case. Now, Director Elmendorf continues, moreover, that same crowding out ten, uh, leads to, in, to increases in interest rates, raising the government's interest payments, and therefore further boosting government deficits and debt. A perpetually rising path of debt relative to GDP is unsustainable. Now that's what our CBO director, a Democrat, actually says. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for the fact that he's a, a very good economist who, as far as I've seen over all these years that I've worked with him and watched him help our committees, is totally honest. No one can legitimately dispute that our entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security in particular, 
are the major forces driving our future national, national debt. No one can dispute that. This chart right here, now this is produced by the Bipartisan Policy Center, shows the cannibalization of the budget and ultimately the American economy. If we go with the status quo on health care entitlements, now just look at this blue line, health care spending. Under the questioning by members of Congress, leading Obama administration economic policy officials such as Treasury Secretary Geithner basically demur on dealing with the runaway entitlement spending. And you can see it's running away. In February, Secretary Geithner identified House Republicans that the administration was putting forth no plan to reform entitlements, but as he said, we know we don't like yours, in quotes. The only official proposals we received from the President and his administration would simply maintain the status quo, a status quo that is so unacceptable that not one member of the House or Senate supported the President's budget. Not one in either body. So what proposals do Senate Democrats support? Now keep in mind, this blue line is the health care spending line. It shows Social Security, which is relatively flat. That goes up a little bit, but that's the Social Security line. The green line happens to be discretionary spending, which has gradually come down, or will come down, from 2012 right here, uh, we're going up to 2052, according to what we're trying to do. Other mandatory programs are pretty much even, but health care spending is running out of control. That's Medicaid, Medicare, and all other health care spending, but especially Medicaid and Medicare. Well, what proposals do the Dem Senate Democrats support? On that, they prefer to keep the American people guessing. Perhaps the president will keep the American people in the dark until he possibly gets, quote, more flexibility, unquote. Democrats have not been willing to put their vision down on paper. By comparison, there's the budget put forward by Paul Ryan. Unlike the Democrats who are hiding the ball from the American people, Republicans have not been afraid to talk about the Ryan budget. Now, this is the Ryan, this is a comparison of budgets. The Ryan budget constrains federal spending and keeps it close to its historic average of 21% of GDP. Here is the House Ryan budget in the red. By exercising that spending discipline, the budget pulls the deficit down to 1.7% of GDP. Now, by comparison, President Obama's budget deficits are at 3.2% of GDP on average, nearly double those of the Ryan budget. When you boil it down, there's a $3.5 trillion more in deficit spending, or should I say in deficit reduction in the Ryan budget here, than in the President's budget represented by the blue line. $3.5 trillion difference between these two. Now that's how much the federal government currently, currently spends in one year. And because of the president's failure to tackle runaway entitlement spending, that yawning fiscal gap between the two plans only gets much bigger in the out years. As you can see right here, Look at how health care spending is going up in these out years from 2012 all the way to 2052. And as you can see, it's constantly going up from 2012. Now, whether we are debating the budget or the debt ceiling or tax mageddon, one thing is clear. The President and the Democrats in Congress do not like to talk in specific numbers. Instead, they want the American people to measure specific Republican alternatives like the Ryan Plan against a series of campaign speeches and attack ads. The current fiscal debate is between the Ryan budget and the phantom Democratic budget. 
Apparently, the Chicago campaign Sharpies have determined that it is safer to wait until after the election to finally unveil the details of the phantom budget, which just in health care spending is going to go forever up and eat our, com our country alive. And their advice has been heeded by the Democrats. If your proposals are never written down, no one can check your math. We do not know the actual fiscal position of my friends on the other side of the aisle, but we can fill in some blanks. We know by their vicious attacks on the spending restraints in the Ryan budget and other Republican proposals that the President and his allies in Congress have no interest, zero, no interest in reducing spending. We know their income tax proposals do not add up to much in terms of revenue. Even if they let the entirety of the current tax relief expire, which is a distinct possibility given the game of chicken they are currently playing with the fiscal cliff, there probably is not enough money to be found in the income tax to pay for the coming explosion in entitlement spending. And you can see it right there just in health care alone. So where does the, where does the Democrats phantom budget find the fist, fiscal juice to fill its structural hole? The answer is simple. A European-style value-added tax, the VAT, or its green cousin, a carbon tax. I'm quite certain that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will write this off as fear-mongering and fabrication. But what other conclusions are left to draw? Without significant reductions in spending or reforms in our entitlement system, neither of which we can expect from this president or the Democrats currently in Congress, there is just not enough money to be found in traditional revenue, in traditional revenue streams to cover the present spending bill. A VAT, value-added tax, or some other euphemized form of VAT, a VAT, appears to be the only option left to our friends on the other side of the aisle if they want to continue spending at current projections. Now, many prominent Democrats have expressed some level of support for the value-added tax in the past. In 2009, during an appearance on the Charlie Rose Show, then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said that a VAT was, quote, on the table, unquote. A year later, President Obama, in a CNBC interview, expressed a willingness to consider a VAT to, to, to address the deficit. Countless high-profile Democratic strategists and advisors, people like John Podesta and Paul Volcker, have unapolog unapologetically suggested implementing a VAT in the U.S. As Recline, a writer with the real cash uh, among... Uh, Cache among liberal Democrats expressed similar views in the Washington Post in 2009. Now, here's a revealing quote from Ezra Klein's article. Quote, first, a simple fact. Tax rates will rise over the next decade. Even with painful spending cuts, tax rates will rise. At some point, taxes have to come further into line with spending, and that means the direction they will travel is up. But, and this isn't, and this isn't a fact, they won't rise within the current system. People don't trust the current system. It feels opaque and unfair, largely because it is. An increase in revenues will have to come alongside a change in the tax system, and the change in the tax system that most economists prefer and that most other countries use is a value-added tax, unquote. Now, I agree with Mr. Klein that our current tax system is a mess. But while he and other liberals see that as an opportunity to seek larger pots of tax revenue elsewhere, my fellow Republicans and I see it as a call to reform the tax code. And we disagree on the fundamental assumption behind Mr. Klein's arguments. Like most of my friends on the other side, Mr. Mr. Klein takes at face value the benefits of future spending. Notice how he uses the phrase, taxes will have to come further into line within spending. 
Now, his focus is almost entirely on the revenue side with only a passing reference to the possibility of reducing spending. A VAT would increase federal revenues, but would also effectively be a tax hike on every American, including those who currently pay no income tax. Excuse me. If a VAT were imposed on top of our existing income tax system, it would likely cripple our economy by imposing new costs on virtually every purchase of goods and services in the U.S. It would hamper manufacturing and kill entire retail sectors. Worst of all, it would be the most regressive tax ever imposed on the American people, disproportionately impacting families with lower incomes who spend a higher percentage of their wages on necessities. Simply put, a VAT would be bad policy in a strong economy. But in the midst of a slow economic recovery, it would be tantamount to economic suicide. It would be jet fuel for larger and larger government. Numerous studies, including a 2010 study by former CBO director Douglas Holt, Holt, Holt Seekin, have demonstrated that in virtually every instance, the implementation of a VAT in other industrialized countries inexorably led to increased spending and an expansion of government. Make no mistake, the current administration and my Democrat friends know only one way of engaging in fiscal reform, broaden the base. And every middle-income family in America should know that they will get hit with higher taxes to pay for the Democrat goal of ever-expanding government control over our economy, over our lives, and over your paychecks. The contention that implementing a VAT would make our government more fiscally responsible is a dog that just won't hunt. The purpose of a VAT would not be to shore up deficits and pay down debts, but to expand the government into new areas backed by an all-new source of funding. Once again, I'm quite certain that virtually all of my Democratic colleagues would publicly deny that their phantom budget includes a VAT. For now, they want us to ignore the VAT behind the curtain and instead just listen as the great and powerful Oz proclaims that every government program can be funded and every budget balanced simply by eliminating the so-called tax cuts for the rich. But the American people are not so easily duped, and they are showing up at Emerald City looking for real leadership and real answers, not just talking points. That, Mr. President, is the real choice facing the American people today. They can choose the fiscal leadership of those like Chairman Ryan, who have, who have put forth actual real-world proposals to bring about reasonable restraints on entitlement spending and maintain taxation at its historic levels, or they can choose the President's impersonation of fiscal leadership, which is built on a phantom budget and large-scale attacks on anyone like Chairman Ryan who offer, offers a real verifiable alternative. But let's be clear, the phantom budget simply cannot translate into reality without collecting taxes that go far beyond those the President and Congressional Democrats publicly support. Given the limitations on existing revenue streams, a value-added tax, even with all of its many drawbacks, is one of very few logical alternatives left to the other side. If they do not plan on instituting a VAT, they need to come clean with the American people and let everyone know how they plan to pay for their outsized spending. Mr. President, regardless of who wins this election, Congress, Congress will have to do more than just click its heels and wish for enough money to pay for all our bills. Therefore, therefore I think it's fair to assume that in lieu of a line item for ruby slippers, the Democrats' phantom budget includes levels and forms of taxation heretofore unseen in the United States. You can be sure that if it is not a VAT, it will be something, something equally damaging to our economy. Now let me just end with just one other thought. And that is that we all know, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, of which I'm a member, but it is a nonpartisan committee run by very good economists, that the bottom 51% of all households, not just people, all households do not pay a dime of income taxes. Now, we've brought that about out of compassion for them, 
uh, I have to say, uh, but it means the upper 49% are paying for just about everything. Well, my friend, Tre Treasury Secretary Geithner pointed out, but yes, they pay payroll taxes. Well, we all do that. That's Social Security. But they don't pay a dime of income taxes. And I was quick to point out to Mr. Geithner that 23 million of them, approximately, get refundable tax credits from the government that's more than they pay in payroll taxes. So they're really not paying payroll taxes. And almost 16 million of them get refundable tax credits from all of us others out there, from the government itself, that is more than they and their employers pay in payroll taxes. The fact of the matter is, is that I don't fail to understand why the, my friends on the other side are looking for ways to spread the base to an unsuspecting 51% that currently don't pay any real income taxes. I think there have to be better ways of spreading the base than doing it through a VAT, which in Europe has proven to be a ready way for politicians to increase spending over and over without really any inhibitions or any real inhibitions. So what I'm talking about today is, uh, is prophetic. It means, without question, that our friends on the other side want to keep spending. They want the federal government to keep growing, all at the cost of individuals. And they want to do it because that's what has kept them in power all these years taking all of your money out there and then claiming that they are compassionate with your money when they're unwilling to be 